Coming up on Doctype, I'll show you how to turn data into markup with Handlebars.js. Then Nick will take you on a magical tour of CSS3 Tech Shadows. So don't forget the tomatoes because it's time for Doctype. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that's absolutely terrified of code, or a developer who thinks the golden ratio is a fast food combo meal, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you a really awesome web professional. So we have a huge announcement. Jim and I are going to be speaking at Converge SE 2011. We're very, very excited about this. Converge is on June 24th and 25th in Columbia, South Carolina. We'll be presenting on building communities, and I'll also be giving a workshop on creating real-time web applications with Node.js, so you're going to want to check it out. So we hope to see you in South Carolina. So. Another conference we are going to be at is LessConf 2011 BCE. Not and speaking, just drinking. Not speaking, yeah. <laughs> um, it is on April 29th and 30th in Atlanta, Georgia. And these guys are so nice, they're giving away a free ticket. So if you go over to facebook.com slash LessConf and then click on the link over on the left-hand side, you can enter to win a free ticket to LessConf. Pretty awesome. And don't forget, Barcamp Orlando is this Saturday at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. We're going to be there, and we hope to see you there, and even maybe even see you give a presentation. Everyone is welcome. Definitely. So, this week, I am going to be teaching you all about CSS3 Tech Shadows. But first, I'll be showing you how to create templates with handlebars. Let's check it out. Now, something we often do when building websites is generate dynamic content on our web pages. And a lot of times that is coming from something like this, where we have just a lot of data and we need to somehow turn this into markup that we'll put onto our page that maybe looks a little something like this. In our example here, we're just using the Twitter search API to search for something in our text box and display it on the page. Now we can use handlebars as a templating language in order for us to turn our data into actual markup. Now, before I show you how it actually works, I'm going to show you what the code for a template looks like. Now, as you can see, it just looks like normal HTML. In fact, it can be done for HTML or really anything else. It's just inserting some dynamic content into your strings. So in this case, this is my template for the page you just saw. Now, we have special parts here highlighted in blue, and they are the dynamic parts of our template. And they're surrounded in double sets of curly braces. So you can see in our first one here, we have a query variable and then some other variables around here. Now, to show you the data that this is being generated from, this is sort of the summary of the results we're going to get from the Twitter search API. So you can see it has a key called query, and it's going to be the actual search query that we sent. And so when we send this to our template, we're going to be able to access the query variable by simply wrapping it in the double curly braces. Now another thing you can see here is we have a result key, and that is an array which contains all of our individual tweets that we're searching for. Now we can see how to use the block formatting in the handlebars by using the double curly braces and using the pound or hash symbol and then the name of the key, in our case, results. Now, if we use the block syntax and it's an array, what it's going to do is going to take everything in between the hash results and the slash results ending block, and it's going to repeat them once for every item in the array. So the first time we do it, it's going to be this first item here, which we'll say is a tweet from user Jamar Hoskins with all of our data. So you can see inside of this block, instead of using the global object with the keys like query and results, we're now using the actual tweet as our local scope. So things like the profile image and from user are now accessible as the names of the keys that we can use in our template. So when we actually render this out, it'll be image source, and instead of profile image URL, it'll actually be the value for the profile image URL of that particular iteration. Now, the next time, it'll be the next tweet and the next tweet, and it'll continue putting that block of code into our rendered template string over and over again. 
Now let's take a look at how we could actually render this in our code. Now we could put all of this template into a JavaScript string in our JavaScript application file, but it's pretty difficult to manage. We don't want to have all of our markup in our JavaScript logic. It'd be nice to keep it in the page where all of our other markup is. So what we can do is we can create a script tag and we'll give it an ID. And what's very important is we give it a type of text slash x dash handlebars dash template. Now, actually, the type doesn't matter so long as it's not JavaScript. That means the browser will take this script and it won't try to parse it as JavaScript, but it also won't display it on the page. And the script serves as a nice container for our markup that we can retrieve later. Then in our code, we can actually grab that by using jQuery in this case to grab that tweet template script tag and get the HTML by using the jQuery HTML method. Then we actually create our template by calling handlebars.compile and we'll pass in the actual string of our template, which we just got in the tweet underscore source variable. So now our template is a function and we can pass into that function the data that we saw before and it will return a fully rendered version of that template using the data you pass to it. So in my case, after I did the AJAX call to get the actual search results, I had a variable called data, and then I could call template and pass it that data. And then I'll be returned this HTML, which is the final HTML I want to render on my page. So what I'll do is I'll simply call .html on this results div to pass it in and render it into the page. Now there are a lot of other cool features in Handlebar, so I recommend you take a look at the documentation and see if it could be useful for you in your web application. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com css3 introduces a ton of new properties but i think one of the most underutilized properties is the css3 text shadow we're going to take a look at a ton of cool effects right now the last time we talked about text shadows was in episode one of doctype and i showed you a pretty cool effect where you can create inset text using text shadows the syntax for this looks like this. You start out with a 0x offset, a 2 pixel y offset, and then a 3 pixel blur radius. So that's going to put the shadow just slightly below your text and then blur it just a little bit. And you want to put the text shadow at a lighter color than your background. And this of course works best for darker colored backgrounds. So that's pretty basic. Let's get a little bit more complex you can create this really cool line art effect by using two text shadows in combination with one another. The first text shadow uses a slight offset from the origin, and then the next text shadow uses a larger offset. Additionally, the first text shadow should be the same color as your background. The next effect is what I call the shadow, which is literally just a text shadow. But the thing that's going on here is the actual color for the text is transparent. And you can create a really cool sort of blurred double vision effect if you use this. The next effect is what I like to call offset printing, where you basically set an RGBA value for your actual text color, and then you dial down the opacity by about half. Then you set a text shadow on your text, and again, you dial down the opacity by half, and the two colors that you pick will blend together and they create this really cool blending effect in between the shadow and the actual text. Next is what I call candy shop. I didn't really know what to call this, but basically this is just a whole bunch of text shadows all together and they're just alternating colors and then increasing the offset by a little bit for each individual shadow. And then the final effect is what I call radioactive. Some people might call this neon glow or something like that. I just picked a green color. So basically all you have to do is put a whole bunch of text shadows and each one is going to have a zero offset of X and Y. And then each shadow is going to get slightly blurrier as you go down. The first shadows should start out as white just to create a really bright effect. 
and then the shadows after that should be the color that you actually want to use. That wraps things up for Tech Shadows, and that is going to be it for this week. Until next time, be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via iTunes or RSS or YouTube, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So come on, why not? So until next time, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype.